Okay. Sorry, I'm running, running a little late. Uh, so today we're going to talk about valuing private businesses. And um, while the principles of valuation don't change, there are some issues with private companies that are going to make them messier to value. So I'm going to just do the start of the class test built around some of those issues. So let's say you have two companies. Same business, same financial mix, uh, same financial practices. One is privately owned, and the other is a publicly traded company. Same business, same debt ratio. Which one will have the higher cost of equity, the privately owned business or the publicly traded company? Uh, the privately owned. Tell me why. There's more risk associated with it. I'll repeat what he said, actually. This is too messy if I take it off. There's more risk. Is there, though? There's the same risk, I thought. So it can't be that there's more risk in the company. It is less diversified. That same risk looked through different lens can look like more risk. And what is it about a private business owner that makes them see more risk? Because they have all their wealth tied up in the business, right? When you're a publicly traded company, your investors are divided, not the company, the investors are diversified, they can look at the same company and see much less risk because they have the law of large numbers working for them. Right? If this company fails, what's the big deal? There are 50 other companies. One of them will go, you have all your money in one company, that company fails, there goes your entire wealth. So one of the things we're going to talk about is how do we get a cost of equity for a private company? Because if I just plug the beta risk premium risk free rate, I'm going to underestimate the cost of equity. Second, when you value private businesses, you're going to see another practice we did not employ with public companies. Is you'll see people value the company and then knock down the value by 20 or 25 percent for what they call an illiquidity discount. We'll talk about why that is, but that practice is across companies. But let's assume you're looking across a bunch of private companies thinking about that discount, and you're trying to think about where that discount should be higher or lower, instead of being one number. So I'm going to give you a bunch of companies, and, like you, and I'd like, like you to tell me in which of these companies you'd put the smallest illiquidity discount. The first is a profitable cash flow generating company being sold to a long-term buyer. The second is a profitable cash flow company to a cash constrained buyer. So basically you have two choices, either a profitable cash flow generating company or an unprofitable one, a buyer who is long-term or the buyer is cash constrained. Let's take each half. Which one of the buyers will demand a bigger discount, the cash constrained or the one who has a long time horizon? The cash constrained, why? Because they need liquidity more. Which one of the two companies is the liquidity a bigger issue, the money-making cash flow generating company or the unprofitable? The unpro so basically, if I were using common sense, I would expect discounts to vary depending on the company and to vary across buyers. That's not the way practitioners do it right now. You get this one size fits all. So we're going to talk about why that is and what to do. Finally, even within a liquidity discounts, let's talk about selling a company in the last quarter of 2008 in the midst of a crisis or selling the same company five years later. Do you think the discount might vary across time? Which, point, which period do you think you would have a bigger discount? It's trying to sell in the end of 2008 or trying to sell in 2013? 2008, the middle of a crisis, you try to sell. So illiquidity discount should not just vary across buyers and companies, should also vary across time. So we're thinking about a good way. If it looks like I'm crying, I'm not. My eyes are just, I'm, my allergies are kicking in, but no. So but it'll look like I'm crying if it adds to the effectiveness of the lecture. Say I'm crying while I'm lecturing. Look, he's so passionate about private companies. Whatever works. So you should expect, to, so if we come up with a way of estimating discounts, we want it to be a way that varies across time, varies across time, you know, buyers. But what's the essence of an illiquidity discount? Why do we demand a discount? Uh, because no other player is around. Like but what, what, why do we care about liquid, illiquid, illiquidity in the first place? I mean, aren't we supposed to pick something to buy and just go in full-fledged? Have you ever had, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Have you ever had buyer's remorse in investing? Here's how it usually manifests itself. You're watching Jim Cramer on CNBC. 
big mistake. <laughs> he throws out a buy recommendation, which he does every three seconds or so. You listen, second mistake. And then in an impulsive moment, you decide to buy 1,000 shares based on a three-second recommendation. And right after you hit the buy button, it says trade. You say, what the hell did I do? And you change your mind, and you sell those 1,000 shares back. What's the cost of buyer's remorse with a publicly traded company? It's going to be the bid ask spread. Even if the stock price hasn't changed, it's going to be the bid ask spread plus the transactions cost on either side, which, thank God, in today's day and age, can be if you're an E Trade, 495. But remember, in the old days, it could have been a 50, 60, 80, 100 dollars. So my point is there's always a cost of buyer's remorse. It's small for a, I was going to say for a publicly traded company, but even among publicly traded companies, that cost can vary depending on whether it was Apple that you did this on or some small NASDAQ stock. You know why? Because the spread can be much higher on illiquid publicly. Illiquidity is a continuum. We think of private companies as illiquid and public. That's not true. There's always illiquidity. So one of the things we're going to talk about is how, as you move up the continuum, the discount can be different. Finally, let's say you have a private business that you're trying to sell. It could be a family business. It could be your own business. And you're looking at four, in this case, three potential buyers. The first is another private individual who really, really likes your business. The second is a private equity fund. And the third is a publicly traded company. Which one of these do you think you can extract the highest value from? You want to try? Which one of these do you think you can extract the highest value? Yeah. Tell me why. First is the discount rate. They don't have to adjust the discount rate for being not diversified. The second also is what about liquidity? They shouldn't care. Why? Because once you become part of a public company, who cares about liquidity? Your shares are being sold. So when I value my private business for a public buyer, guess what I'm going to use? I'm going to value just like a public company. I'd use a market beta, come up with the cost of capital, value the company, say I'm done. At the other extreme, which one of the companies was going to pay me the lowest price? The private owner. Why? Because they're going to charge this huge cost of equity, and they're going to attach a liquidity discount. Embedded in here is actually a very, very sad message for those of you who love mom, mom and pop businesses. Let's face it. We all have this emotional attachment to small businesses owned by the person behind the counter. You know what this is telling you? Over time, what's going to happen to those businesses? They're going to either become public or become part of publicly traded companies because that's going to be the best potential buyer for these businesses. So we're going to talk a little bit about that phenomenon as well as we go through. So let's let's start on private company valuation. So let's start with the first issue of pro well, first. Let's focus on process. To value a, publicly, a, pri a private business, here's what I need. I need to first decide whether I want to value the entire business or value equity. Well, that's pretty much the same starting point I had for a public company. Second, I need cash flows and discount rates with that approach. The process of valuing private companies is no different than the process of valuing public companies. But I'll tell you the biggest challenge that you're going to face with valuing pub privately owned companies is that there is no market price. You know why that's a problem? When you finish valuing a company and you got a value per share, what's the first number you check? Nice. And let's say you got $1 and the stock price is 172. What's the next thing you did? Unless you had a huge ego, you went and checked your input saying, what did I screw up? We forget how much of a crutch it is to have a market price out there. Even when I valued Uber, I wasn't doing it with a blank slate, right? Why? Because there was a rumored number out there, 100 billion. If I'd got 6 billion, I'd probably say, you know what? I know I can do value, but I'm probably screwing up something. I'm probably Mr. Zero, a business something in there. Without a market price, you don't have anything to compare to. And within your valuation, did you use market price in any of your inputs in your DCF? What were the weights used in your cost of capital? There were market value weights. So when you 
don't have a market price, it's going to create issues for you, both in the input stage and after you're done with it. The second is, if you complain about accounting standards with publicly traded companies, you should see some of the accounting standards at small private businesses. So let's take each of these. No market value. Let's face it, market values are inputs in DCF. If I take that out, you might say, how the heck do I compute cost of capital when I don't have a market value of equity and a market value of debt? Okay. So we'll start with that. And then once you get the output, you're going to say, what do I compare this to? How do I know whether I'm even remotely close to the truth? So we're going to deal with both those issues. And finally, any kind of risk measure that comes from market prices, you will not have for a private company. Like what? If the way you get betas is the way most people get them, by running a regression of stock returns against market returns, you can't that for, get that for a private company. Thank God we don't do that. But you can see how people who get betas only from regressions are going to be trapped with private businesses. Let's talk about the cash flow issues. The first is there are very few private businesses which have been around 125. There are some of them, but most of them are much shorter histories. Second, as I said, accounting standards are all over the place. I still remember somebody in, a, in an evaluation class I was teaching five years ago decides to value her mother's flower shop. And I encouraged her. I said, no, this is good. You know, you could bond with your mother, and this would be good for you to spend 15 weeks talking to her about dollars and cents. So about four weeks in, she comes and says, I have to change companies. I said, what happened? Do you have a fight with your mom? Is there some deep emotional scarring coming to the surface? She said, I asked her for her financials, and she took me into a back room where the walls were all covered with post-it notes. And I said, Mom, what is this? She said, that's a revenue wall. That's the expense wall. That's my capital expenditure wall. At the end of every year, I pull the post-it notes down and put up the financials. I mean, who has the time to do accounting if you have to be in the front store? So I understand. I mean, but she said, this is not gap, obviously. I don't think IFRS allows post-it accounting. But she said, what do we, and, but that's a reality. In really small businesses, the accounting is held together by string and threads. Here's something you should always be careful about with private companies. There's an intermingling of the personal and the business expense that's almost unavoidable. That company car or van every evening seems to disappear at 3.30. Around the time the kids' schools let out, I don't know whether it was a picking up the kid, but th there's a very gray area because, after all, it's your business, it's your, you know, so. And finally, one of the issues you run into, even with very professionally accounted for private businesses, is often owners don't charge themselves a salary. And you can see why, right? You're going to keep what's left over anyway. Why do you bother? But you see why this creates a problem for somebody buying the company, if I take your financials at face value, and I pay saying, look, you made 200000 a year last year, that's pretty good, I'll pay you 10 times that, what's the danger I face? If you are working 18 hours a day in that business to de deliver the 200000 and I don't want to, what will I need to do next year right after I buy your business? I have to hire an accountant, an inventory, because after all, you were doing all of this stuff, now I've got to hire three people to do the job you did, and by the time I finish paying them, what do I discover? You are never making money on this business. And now I paid for it. So the salary dividend issue is something we've got to factor in, which means when you, re when you look at the financial of a private company, I always look for owner salary. And if there isn't one, I ask the owner what he or she does, hoping that he's an idle layabout who does nothing, in which case I can say I can ignore you. But most of the time, owners of private businesses do pretty much everything, and that has to be incorporated into the income. So let's look at the process of private company valuation. The first question I always have when somebody says, what's the value of my business? So because a lot of private business owners think I'm this valuation practice for free. So what do, can you tell me what the value of my business is? I say, why? See, what do you mean? Because when you look at private company valuations, your motive can affect the value estimate for you. And here are your possible motives. You can value a private company for sure. You just are curious about what your business is worth. You just want a number for what it is. You can value it for legal purposes, either because you have tax issues coming up or because you're, you have a divorce and you've got to give away half of this business. Already you can see motives start to come into play. You can be valuing a private company for a transaction. The transaction can be for a sale to another individual, a sale to a 
of one partner to another, a sale to a publicly traded company, or maybe it's a valuation as a prelude to going public. So when somebody asks you to value their private business, always start with the question of why do you need that number? Because the way you're going to approach the valuation might be very different. Remember, though, private company valuation is not just at private companies. When a public company spins off a division of the company, you face many of the same challenges that you do with a private company, which is there's no market price. You can't get the inputs you need to value the company. So this is something you might find even in that sum of the parts valuation in deciding how much you will get for the company. So let's look at, I'm going to look at four classes of private company valuations. And as we go through this, I want you to focus on what's changing as I go. The first is I'm going to look at a private to private transaction, okay? a medical practice. You're a doctor. You've built up this great practice. I'm a young doctor. I'm coming up. You sell your practice to me. I'm going to take the, all of my savings, probably borrow money, and buy your practice, private to private. I'm going to look at private to public, okay? for sale to a publicly traded company. I'm going to look at private to IPO and look at what's different about a private to IPO. And I'm finally going to look at a private to a venture capitalist, a venture capitalist to public, kind of a more messy process. So let's start with a private to private transaction. If you look at private to private transactions, there are three key issues that you almost always run into. The first is the potential buyer for your company is almost never going to be a diversified investor. Why? Nobody has that much money. So if I'm a doctor trying to buy my first practice, how the heck am I going to be diversified? Where did I get the wealth to get diversified in the first place? So the buyer, neither the buyer nor the seller is diversified. Second, once I buy that practice, I'm stuck with it, right? The cost of buyer's remorse when you buy a private business is far greater than the cost of buyer's remorse. So let's say I buy the practice thinking it's lucrative. And let's say three months in, I find this practice is not the right practice for me. Getting out is much messier, so the illiquidity issue becomes a much bigger one. And thirdly, there's a key person issue. Remember you built this great practice. Everybody in town knows you. You sell me your practice. I I I decide what to pay for your practice based on how much money you made. And then you leave, and I walk into your office. The next day, the first patient, you're my patient, you come in. You say, who the hell are you? I'm your new doctor. Say, you're not my doctor. I've been coming to this office for 35 years. You don't look anything like that person. First, you've switched sexes. It was a she. You don't look like a he. You look like you're 35 years younger. And you don't look that doctorly. I have this vision of what a doctor looks and turns and walks out. See what's going to happen? That lucrative practice could very quickly become a much less lucrative practice because a key person is left. It's called a key person discount. Something we don't apply with public companies, but even in some public companies, you could argue that there is a key person, that key person. Can, what would Amazon be worth if more whatever pictures of Jeff Bezos come out and he decides to step down? I don't know. What would Tesla be worth if Elon Musk actually went to jail? It's only a question of time before he ends up in jail. This guy is like so mentally unstable. Who knows what the next tweet will be? I would kill you or something, and then the next thing, six months in jail. So while we do it with private businesses, especially around personal service, plumbing business and you know, doctor's business, we deal with the person, this could be something that even is true at public companies, but it's especially true with private to private. So I'm going to give an example of a private to private transaction. Okay. So let's assume. You've been asked to value an upscale French restaurant. The key words are upscale in French here. For sale by the owner, who also happens to be the chef. So it's upscale French. The chef really does matter, right? You can't pull some guy off the streets. Can you make some nice French food for me? Okay. The potential buyer is you. So you can't be both. So you can't be the appraiser. So let, I'll be the appraiser. You can be the buyer. You went to investment banking but you got tired after two years. You've decided you'd rather be a restaurant owner. I don't know how you came up with the money. You're going to cash out all your savings, your pension fund, and you're going to buy the restaurant. And it's key. You're going to go full in on this restaurant. You have access to the financial statements for the last three years. In the most recent year, the restaurant reported $1.2 million in revenues, $400,000 in pre-tax operating profit. And it has no debt outstanding, but it has a lease commitment of 120,000 each year for the next 12 years. 
So you, the financials, you know what they owe. Let's do a valuation of this. Let's start by looking at the past income statements. So basically, you see the income statements from last year. It does look like you made 400000 But the one thing you notice is that there is no salary expense. Already, there should be a red flag saying that 400000 is before I pay a chef. So if I'm buying this company, remember, you're an investment banker. I don't think you've been working on your cooking skills for the last few years. You can't say, look, I'll be the chef. You could. But God help your poor customers who show up and say, can you make me some, I don't even know what, I don't like French food. What's a classic French dish? Uh, so I don't know. So whatever it is, you make it and you, and you bring it out and say, it looks like a burger. No matter what you make, it looks like a burger because that's the only thing you can make. Mm -hmm. So you just have 15 different varieties of burger, you attach different names to them. You won't last as a restaurant very long. So looking at it, you basically have a fairly professionally done financial statement. First is that you have. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through that financial statement. But before we take that step, let's go back and think about risk and discount rates in this case. If you look at conventional risk and return models, which is what we've drawn on all the way through every valuation we've done in the class, we assume marginal investors were diversified. And because they were diversified, we measured the risk in the equity using a beta. And then we plugged it in. And, and while you can argue about the mechanics of should I use a beta, or mul multiple betas, arbitrage, price, but the basic presumption was the marginal investor is diversified. In this valuation, I've got to be more careful because the potential buyer which is used is not going to be diversified. In fact, you're going to be the exact opposite of diversified. And because you're not diversified, I can't just use a beta and just plug it in. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with something I said I wasn't going to do, right? I said I can't use a beta. I'm going to start with the average unlevered beta for publicly traded restaurants. And I came up with 0.86. I mean, but if you look at the publicly traded restaurants in the US, you're going to get what, McDonald's, Burger King. So you could actually argue maybe this is not the right beta. Maybe you should be using the unlevered beta for high-end retailers, because that's more in line with who eats at a five. No. So you can already see the discussion of what's a, what a good bottom-up beta is is open for questioning, depending on the private company valuation. So here's where I'm going to bring in the fact that you're not diversified. Let's think about this as an algebra problem. Let's suppose you have a company with 100 units of risk. Some of it is market risk, and some of it is firm specific. So there are 20 units of market risk, 80 units of firm specific. If this is a publicly traded company, what's my argument? You can diversify away the 80 units of risk. All I'm going to focus on is the 20 units of risk. So the market beta captures these 20 units of risk. Now think about you as a buyer. Which, how many units of risk are you exposed to? All 100, right? So think of it purely from an algebraic standpoint. If you demanded a beta of 0.8 for the 20 units of risk as a, pub, as a diversified investor, since you're undiversified exposed to all of the risk, roughly speaking, what should your beta be? 5 times 0.8, which is 4. I'm going to call it a total beta. So if you can tell me what percentage of the risk in your business comes from the market, I can take a beta and scale it up to reflect the rest of the risk and call it a total beta. 25 years ago, I concocted this measure called total beta. I concocted it. So I was writing the chapter on private company valuation. And I was asking appraisers, how the heck? Because it's clear that if I put in risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium, I come up with too low a number. I said, how do you guys deal with this, that you come up with this really low number? You know what their answer was? We just add 10%. I said, what? So we just add 10%. So if you come risk-free rate plus beta times risk premium is 8%, we just make it 18%. I said, really? Why 10%? You know what their answer was? It was here when I got here. Basically, this is what we've always been doing. There's no good reason. I said, that doesn't work for me. I can see why the cost of equity for a private business should be higher than a public company, but I don't see why it always has to be 10%. In some business, I might demand 6% more. In others, I might demand 20% more. So here's how I'm going to come up with the unlevered beta to use for this restaurant. First, I'm going to get rid of the restaurant beta. I don't think this is a restaurant, a you know, publicly traded restaurant kind of risk. I'm going to start with the unlevered beta for retailers. And then, if, you, if I could somehow tell you how much of the risk in a typical retail company comes from the market, then you can do what I just did. 
Is there anything I can use? Remember, the way I get the beta is about running regressions of each stock against the market, right? So remember those Bloomberg beta pages? Now I get the raw beta. Is there anything in that Bloomberg output that I could use to get a sense of how much of the risk in these companies comes in the market? If you look, in fact, if you look at the R squared, that's exactly what it measures, right? The R squared tells you what percentage of the risk in each of these stocks, I mean, what percentage, the variance of each stock, to be precise, comes from the market. Now, my, when I originally concocted total beta, I used to use the average R squared, and then I stopped and realized I had a problem, because beta is a standard deviation concept. It's not a variance concept. It comes from standard deviation. So what I actually have to do is take the square root of the R squared, and I won't insult you by asking what the square root of the R squared is. It's R, R squared. You take the square root, the square goes away. R is the correlation coefficient. That correlation coefficient for, rest, for retailers is about 0.5. Do you see where I'm going to go next? The beta that I got, the market beta, is 1.18, looking at, re, uh, at, at retailers. But only half the risk in a retailer comes from the market. I'm going to scale up the beta to reflect the fact that I'm now exposed to the rest of the risk. I come up with a total beta of 2.36. So because you're not diversified, the beta you're going to plug in to get to your cost of equity will be that unlevered beta. But to get from unlevered to levered, when I had a public company, I had to take one extra step, right? Which is, I had to lever the beta up using what debt to equity? A market debt to equity. And I'm now trapped. Do you see why I'm trapped? I know the unlevered beta I want to use for this restaurant is 2.36, but I don't have a market debt and a market equity. And I'm going to give you two ways of getting it. One is really easy, and you can adopt like this. The other is a little messier, but I think it's worth thinking about. Here's the first way you can do it. You can say, look, there's a reason why companies in the sector have the debt ratios they do. In this case, I'm going to take the, uh, the, the debt to equity ratio of publicly traded companies in the space. Let's say it's 14%. And assume that this is the debt to equity ratio I would have as a company. And use that to come up with a levered beta. Why are we doing that? We're assuming there's a reason companies in the sector have the debt to equity ratios they do. I probably wouldn't use the retail debt to equity. I'd probably use the restaurant debt. It looks like I'm mixing apples and oranges, but I'm asking different questions. So one way to get this debt to equity is look at the industry average for publicly traded companies, which will pretty much put you back at a levered beta for the public. You're saying, that I don't like that. That's too rough. There's a second way of doing this. And I've kind of given you the solution before, but I'll give it again. If you could somehow get an estimated intrinsic value for equity, and you could plug it in, you could lever beta with that estimated value of equity. And you're estimating a value of equity at the end of this process. What if you could take that estimated value of equity and use it to come up with the debt to equity ratio? But there's one catch, right? Which is, there's going to be circularity, right? To get the cost of equity, I need it. But if you check that iteration box in Excel, again, magic happens. You can actually use your own estimated value of equity to come up with the debt to equity ratio. And the good news is you'll always get convergence. And you'll end up with a debt to equity ratio that then reflects what you think the value of equity is. So in this case, I went with the industry average, 14.33%, and ended up with a levered beta of 2.56. That 2.56 beta gives me a cost of equity of 14.5%. The risk-free rate and the risk premium don't change. They still reflect what the risk-free rate in the currency is. And the equity risk premium is still the equity risk premium. The price of risk doesn't change. It's just you're exposed to more units of risk because you're not diversified. So that cost of equity of 14.5% becomes the input into my cost of capital. Now let's look at the cost of debt. For publicly traded companies, one of the luxuries you have is you can cheat. You can look at the rating for the company. With private businesses, you will never find a rating. But remember, even with public companies that did, that, that did not have ratings, there was a way we estimated cost of debt, which is we looked at interest coverage ratios and ratings that come out of it. I took the interest coverage <coughs> ratio for this company and used it to come up with a rating of double B plus. The default spread I got was three and a quarter percent. Add it to the risk-free rate, I get a cost of debt of seven and a half percent. Do not use a book interest rate, even though it's a private company. You still want to replace it with a current cost of borrowing money long term. I'm netted out the tax rate, after tax cost of debt of four and a half percent. 
The weights are actually just a 14.33 percent debt and equity, the, the debt to equity ratio. So basically, the weights are the industry average debt ratios. I come up with a cost of capital for the company of 13 and a quarter percent. So the sequence looks very similar. The only changes I made is I have to use the total beta. I have to use either an industry average debt to equity ratio or my estimated equity. And I have to remember that when I do my cost of debt, I always have to do a synthetic rating and build up to it. That cost of capital is what I'm going to use to value this restaurant. Any questions on computing the cost of capital for a private business? Now let me clean up the financial statements. One part of the cleaning up is pretty simple. I hired a chef. Let's say I could get a chef for 150000 a year. So that reduces my operating income. I also capitalize leases. Why do I do that? Because that's what I should be doing at every company. Private companies are not exempt from it. So I capitalize the leases and I hire a chef. My adjusted operating income is now 370000 instead of the 400000 you saw before. And my net income is 180 million. So I've adjusted the financial statements. Half of it is the adjustment for the absence of expense for a chef. For a chef. And the other half is because of the fact that I've capitalized leases. This is going to be the basis for my forward-looking valuation. So I've got my revenues, I've got my expenses. Now let me assess what effect it'll have that the chef who owns the restaurant now is leaving. Let's face it, many of these customers, because it's an upscale French restaurant, are not coming because of the restaurant's name, but because of the chef's name. Now you've seen, you know, especially with Food Network, and chefs can be celebrities, a celebrity chef can make, Gordon Ramsay is your chef. Your restaurant's going to be full every day. I mean, he could be serving crap, but no, people say, Gordon Ramsay served me crap. That's really good crap. I'll pay a lot of money for that crap. <laughs> eh? But the reality is you can have celebrity chefs, and you have celebrity chefs when they leave, a big chunk of the restaurant leaves with them. Now, this is actually very tough to actually work out the impact. Right? Because you can't go to each customer sitting and say, what would you do if tomorrow I was the chef? They say, I'm not coming back. But even if you said, I'm going to hire another chef, it's very difficult to gauge, but you almost have to. So in this case, I estimated that they'd lose about 20% of revenue. Let's say I do a little quick market test and say, if this chef left and I hired another chef, would you come back at 20%? Is that going to lower the value for the restaurant? Significantly. And if you're the person trying to sell this restaurant, that's bad for you, right? And this is the same thing, a doctor trying to sell his practice, a dentist trying to sell his practice. The dentist in the town I used to live in had a very lucrative practice, especially with kids because they have to keep coming back every week to get their braces tightened. I mean, it was like a money machine. And he retired at like 53. So he says, I walk in one day and he's you know, with my kid and he says, you know, Oh, well, I'm retiring next week, and I'm trying to sell the business. And I you know, said, great. Man. He said, I already sold the business. Six weeks later, I come back, and he's still there. I said, I thought you sold the business. He said, I did. He said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm just hanging out. Do you see the rationale why he was hanging out? In a sense, he was creating that almost zone where when, the old pa when his patients came in, he would be there and he'd lead you to the new dentist and he'd kind of hang around there until so that you didn't feel too uncomfortable. You say, what a nice guy. He didn't do it because he was a nice guy, but because he didn't hang out, he'd probably have got 25% less for the practice. So dental and medical practice is often very common for a two-year or a one-year period where the old dentist, the old doctor stays around until the new one comes up. It's a key person discount issue. So the next time you have a doctor or a dentist, you go and sold his business and ask him what the key person discount was. He'll have no idea what you're talking about, but that's a big factor driving how much you get for that practice. And just because you're doing a private company valuation, you can't forget your fundamentals. Like what to grow, you got to reinvest. Yeah, private companies have to do it too. And what's it going to depend on? How fast you want to grow and what kind of return and capital you make on the reinvestment. In this case, let's assume that you're a mature restaurant. You've got 55 seats and that's pretty much it. You're not going to sell more. So, but you expect to raise prices, inflation rates. So let's assume you have a 2% growth rate. And your return on capital is pretty solid. You have a nice lease sold. The chef has a good name. 20% return on capital. You'll have to reinvest 
about 10% of your after-tax operating income every year to keep growing just like you would in a public company. I think we have all the pieces we need. Let's value this restaurant. First, I use the adjusted EBIT with the 20% drop for the key person discount. 40% tax rate, 13.25% cost of capital, it reflects the total beta. A 2% growth rate and a 10% reinvestment rate. You plug the numbers in, you get a value for the restaurant of 1.45 million. Subtract, don't forget to subtract out the lease. Essentially, if my valuation is right, you're going to get about 520,000 for your equity in the restaurant. Because remember, you're going to sell the restaurant with the lease in it. So you're not going to get the 1.44 because the person is going to be stuck with the commitment. One point. There's one thing I actually consider doing. This is based on the presumption that you can keep this restaurant going forever, right? I actually thought maybe this would be more, in fact, I still think it would be more realistic to do the cash flows for only 12, 12 years. What's the magical about 12? That's when the lease runs out. Because when the lease gets renegotiated, God only knows what the numbers will look like. So with private businesses, leave open that possibility. Instead of assuming forever, you assume a finite period. It doesn't make it any more difficult. It just makes it, in fact, more compact. You can have 10% growth for the next 12 years, and then the game ends. But nothing we've done violates any of the principles of valuation, but there are some practices with private companies you did not adopt that you have to with public companies. And finally, there is the liquidity effect. And if you think about what I said earlier when we did that start of the class test, I said, let's accept it. Liquidity is a clear and present danger, or illiquidity is a clear and present danger. So I should be attaching a discount to the value because I never know when you have to. How much the discount should be should vary across companies, should vary across time, and should vary across buyers. So if I'm doing a discount, it has to be almost transaction specific. So let's take a look at how private company appraisers come with this 25% that you often see as rule of thumb. They're based on actually two sets of studies that have been around a fairly long time. The first are restricted stock. And these are restricted stock that go back to the days before. They, now they're common with employees. These were restricted stock issues made in a time by companies that wanted to raise capital but did not want to go through the SEC filing process. You say, how do they get away with it? In returning for not filing a prospectus, these companies, when they issued, when they, when they placed the stock, the people getting the stock were not allowed to trade them for two years. So these were public companies. They were issuing the shares, but if you got the shares, you couldn't trade them for two years. You see how this gives you a chance to observe how much illiquidity matters? It's a publicly traded stock. Let's say the stock price is 10, and I say, put the sh place shares with you, and I say, look, you can't trade the shares for the next two years. First, will you pay me $10? Probably not. But if I can observe how much you pay, I'm getting a sense of how much do you, is the liquidity. So the first set of studies, which are called restricted stock studies, basically look at those kinds of stocks. The second set of studies look at transactions that happen just before IPOs between owners of a business. So the way the study would work is you take Uber, and in the six months prior to the IPO, you'd look to see how much owners, because people will often transact with each other, what the prices they transact at. Again, the idea being if you know there's going to be an IPO at 10, you probably would expect to get close to it. But because you want to get out quicker, you're going to have to settle for less. You get an illiquidity discount. So almost all the studies basically are built upon looking at these patterns. So let's look at the restricted stock studies and what they find. The first set of studies find huge discounts, 35, 40, 40, which is great for private company appraisers. You know why? What are 90% of appraisals for? Tax court and divorce court, where your objective is to have as low a number as possible. So, this was, so many of these studies actually were paid for by private company. Talk about bias in the study. And then they would use the 40%. They'd feed it in. In fact, Bill Silber, who, you know, who's a professor here in the mid-'80s, looked at these studies and said, why do they keep just reporting the average? If you have 50 restricted stocks and you have discounts in each of them, why don't you look to see why the discount varies? And he ran this regression 
of how much the price was relative to the market price. So basically it took the restricted store. So think of that as one minus the discount basically. And he ran a regression against the level of revenues in the companies, hypothesis being small companies probably have bigger discounts than big ones. The second was how much the block was. This is a big block. Again, the, the hypothesis would be the bigger the block, the bigger the discount because I'm making you hold a big chunk of the stock. Third, he looked at whether the company was making money or losing money, saying if you're a money-losing company, the discount is probably going to be much greater. And finally, he also looked to see whether there might be some side game going on to see if the person who's getting the stock was a customer, in which case he might pay a higher price up front in return for discounts on the and basically, he found that every one of the hypotheses held in, his, in this particular regression. That the discounts varied across companies. They were, in fact, larger for smaller companies. They were, in fact, larger for large blocks than small blocks. They were larger for money losing than money making companies. And when you had a customer, basically, they tend to be smaller if a customer was on the other side, suggesting some side benefit somewhere else. He's like, how does this help me? So this study came out in 86, and when I first started looking at these restricted stock discounts, I said, is there a way I can use this regression to figure out why discounts should be larger for small? So guess what I did? I focused in on the coefficient. And what I did was I said, let okay, so you as a private company appraiser say, tell me that your base discount is 25%. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the level of revenues you have, take that silver regression and say, based on that regression, how much your discount should vary as a function. So I'm, in fact, holding your base 25% discount fixed and adjusting the discount for how big your revenues are. Bigger revenue companies should have bigger, or smaller discounts than small revenue companies. And I said, oh, by the way, are you making money or losing money? He said, why do I care? If you're a money-losing company, I would expect you. So I took the same regression on the previous page. Money-losing company, you have the coefficient. I computed what that discount would have to be for your money. So here's how it worked. If you are a billion dollar company making money and you say, how much of a discount should I use? I'm going to say roughly 15%. If you're a money losing company with 10 million in revenues, how much of a discount should be 34%? So even if you're really stuck on this 25% in restricted stocks, I'm going to give you a way of differentiating across companies. So I actually have an Excel spreadsheet on my website where I take your base discount, I take this regression, I fit it in, and say, tell me your revenues, tell me whether you're making or losing money, and I'll tell you what your discount should be given the silver regression. The IPO transaction data is so mind-boggling, I think it's all fixed. I think it's entire, this, this, and I'll tell you why. I think the numbers are so unbelievable. Here's what they find. They find in the six months prior to an IPO, that the discount is about 45 to 50%. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you are, an in, you are an investor in Uber, you're a VC investor, and you know there's going to be an offering. We've known that for a while there's going to be an offering. The offering is going to be around 100 billion. This is a, the worst kept secret in the ride sharing business. So November or December of last year, I come to you, will you sell me your shares? You say, for the right price, I will. And I offer you half of the 100 billion. So I'm based on a 50 billion pr price. Unless you're really, really desperate or really, really stupid, you're going to say, I'm not doing it. But if you believe this, you find these huge discounts. I'm going to suggest that both the restricted stock studies and these IPO studies are fakely flawed because they have a sampling bias. Let me explain what I mean by that. If you look at restricted stock studies, what do these companies do? They skip the prospectus, the filing. They issue shares at a 25% discount. Why would you do that? You really, really, really need money, and nobody will buy your shares in a public offering, right? So what, am I, what does that tell you about you? You are a basket case company. And what are we doing? We're taking the discount, the liquidity discount from basket case companies, applying them across all private companies. And this was a clear statistical problem, but these appraisers never wanted to open that box. And they never got pushed back because the IRS was too cheap to even hire expert witnesses. And finally, one day, the IRS said, we're losing too much money in this. We're going to actually spend the money to hire somebody who has some degree of statistical knowledge to come and look at how much of a sampling bias there is. 
So they hired this guy and he was actually, he went through the data and he actually broke out how much of that 30% discount you saw with restricted shares came from illiquidity and how much came from the sampling bias. And he concluded that about 10% came from the illiquidity and 20% came from the sampling bias. So in the next court case, he came and said it was 10%. The expert witness for the appraiser said it was 30%. So what do you think the courts used? This is the stupidity of the legal system. You have two expert witnesses, 10 and 30. So you know what the judge did, right? He used 20. You know what this creates? Basically, each side is an incentive now to move further away from the truth because they know you're going to split the difference. But the battle was joined because now this question of sampling bias is out there. So over time, restricted stock have become a less defensible. You think, what's wrong with the IPO studies? What did these studies do? They looked at stocks that went public, then they worked backwards in looking at the six months before the IPO to see what transactions happened. They looked at the discount. Do all companies that plan to go public actually go public? No, a lot of public offerings are pulled. Do you see where the sampling bias comes from? Because you're looking at a subset of companies that actually went public, you're missing the fact that not every company is an Uber. There are a lot of companies that are rumors that there will be a public offering. The price is kind of fuzzy. And if I'm really in need for cash, I'm going to sell at what's a discount on pretty much a fuzzy number. And what I'm capturing here then is a subset of companies. So if I wanted to do this discount right, what should I do? I should look at all companies that plan to go public. I should look at the six months before they plan to go public and compare what you sold for to what the price was of the companies that went public and the companies that didn't. Remember, those companies, the price probably collapsed. And guess what? The discounts that are being 40 or 50% might become a more reasonable 5 or 10 or 15%. I think it's unconscionable that so much of a liquidity assessment comes from looking at these sampling biases. And of course, when you push appraisers, they say, what choice do we have? This is the only place we get to observe how much illiquidity matters. And they say, that's not true. Every day I wake up, and there are 7,300 sample observations where I can observe how much illiquidity. You know what I'm talking about, right? What do we call the illiquidity discount for a public company? The bid-ask spread. I can observe the bid-ask spread for every publicly traded stock. So about 10 years ago, here's what I did. I took the bid-ask spread for every publicly traded company. And I stated as a percentage of the price, because the spread is a dollar value. Is it? So if you have a $2 price. Let's say the bid-ask bid spread is $1.50 to 2. So it's a 50 cent spread. If I divide by the price, that's almost a 25%. So I do that for every company. And then I threw in variables that I hoped would explain the difference. So I threw in how much the company had as revenues. Hypothesis would be large companies. Maybe the spread is smaller than small companies. I threw in whether it was making money or losing money. Looks like the silver regression, right, but applied spreads. I also threw in how much cash the company had, because you have a lot of cash. Why would I want to even attach a discount? Because I can just take the cash. And finally, I threw in the trading volume, assuming the more you, I can trade, and those coefficients were all statistically significant. I have a regression now for the bid-ask spreads for public literature. You're saying, how does this help me with a private company? I took my private company and I plugged in the values for my private company. Remember, I have the re revenues, it's making money. And I come up with a predicted bid-ask spread for a private You're saying, what does that mean? It's a private company. You know what? That's, that's called a synthetic spread. It is really my estimate of your illiquidity discount. I said, if the discount is an extension of how investors are treating discounts at public companies, your discount should be only 12.88%. And I think that's a much fairer number than attaching a 25% fixed number or taking the 25% and even doing the silver adjustment, because I think I'm being incredibly unfair in taking this discount that comes from a bias sample and attaching it to a perfectly healthy French restaurant but there is no sampling bias to begin with. So basically, I'm saying if we're going to think about illiquidity, let's stop thinking about public companies as liquid and private companies as illiquid. Let's think about the continuum in this process and try to bring in the information into our assessment. So that's private to private. You can see it's messy. It's messy because it depends on how diversified the, <coughs> the buyer is and how much you care about liquidity. 
So let's talk about private to a publicly traded company. Private to publicly traded company first, remember the publicly traded company doesn't have to be diversified, their investors need to be diversified. So if they're diversified, I can use a market bailer. And once this private business becomes part of that public company, investors can trade the shares, so liquidity is not an issue. So guess what happens? When I value it as a public company, I will use a cost of capital that ref of, of valued for sale to a public company. I will value the cost of capital that I would get for a public company. And when I do the actual valuation, there will be no illiquidity discount. So instead of getting 453000 for my equity, which is what I got with the private buyer, I get $1.5 million for the same. Because first, I don't have that, that, that higher cost of equity coming from the total beta. And second, I'm knocking off real liquidity. There, 25, maybe 30 years ago, if you walked into a pharmacy in the US, pharmacies, the owner of the pharmacy was almost always behind the counter. They were predominantly privately owned. Today you walk into a pharmacy in the US and you look up, what do you say? CVS, Dwayne Reed, publicly traded company. It's almost inexorable in business after business, public companies will drive out private businesses, not because private businesses are not efficiently run, they're probably more efficiently run, but the owners of private businesses are not bearing risk in an efficient way. You're putting all of your wealth or much of your wealth in it. And what we're capturing here is the effect that that has on how much value you will see in your own business. Now do you see one of the, I'm going to talk about the failures of acquisition driven growth. This is one of the few ways in which acquisitions have been able to pay off. You know, you know what a roll up is? Roll up, here's what you do. You take a business where much of it is privately owned right now. Blockbuster was created with a roll up. Because when Blockbuster first came to being, video rental stores all over the country were privately owned. You have a store here, a store there. So what Blockbuster would do is it'd go in and buy the two or three best video rental stores in each town and city. And then it would put the CVS name on it, but it rolled, I'm sorry, not CVS, Blockbuster. Maybe CVS should do the same thing. No. And they rolled up these things and made a publicly traded company. And in the process, they created incredible value because you were buying these video rental stores. The owners sold them as if they were private to private transactions. And then CVS, once, I'm sorry, so I keep saying CVS. Blockbuster, once they had all these video rental stores rolled up, then went public and they got it. Browning Ferris, you know what, what it does? Garbage disposal company. You know how garbage disposal the garbage disposal business was structured around the country? Privately owned garbage companies, mostly controlled by the mafia probably. <laughs> so they had to wait for the mafia to get, get out of the game. And then Browning Ferris just went rolling around these those garbage disposal companies, create a public company. So when you're about roll-ups, this is what they're doing. Is they're taking private businesses, and both sides walk, off from, walk away from the table thinking they've got a win, right? Because you as a private business owner are being offered 30 or 50% more than what anybody was paying for businesses like yours. You say, I got a, a, a gain there. And I pay you less than what this business is worth, from a publicly traded investor's perspective. So when you think about bargaining, you're the private business, the owner of the restaurant, and you have two values, about 454,000 if you value private to private, 1.484 million if you value. So let's say I'm the potential public bar, okay? So you're the owner, we walk into the table. Remember, it's a bargaining session. Let's play this out. What do you think I'm going to start my offer at? I'm sorry, I know what you're worth. For it. I'll give you 500000 And I'll make it seem like I'm doing you a favor. What are you going to try? You're going to say, look, I took my valuation class. I know you should be paying one point. Look, I did a market beta, 1.484 million. Who's going to win? If I'm the only buyer in town, I'm going to get away with 500, maybe I'll give you 510 because you did that total beta market beta thing, you know, you may, I'll give you an extra 10,000 for doing it, now go away. But I'm going to push towards a 484,000 because you have no other place to go. So if you're advising a business owner, not only should you advise to sell to a publicly traded company, you want 
to get two publicly traded companies interested in you. Right? So you may play them off against each other. And in some businesses, especially businesses where people want to get into, that's exactly what you're looking for, is enough competition that you can say, look, you know. And if you can get a private equity player into the game, you can see that this game gets more interesting, right? Because now it's not an either or. A private equity investor might not be as diversified as a public company, but they're more diversified than you as an owner. So you might say, look, 700,000. And it, there it's easy to get multiple private equity investors because they all want to get into these lucrative businesses. So it's, it's becoming easier for private business owners to kind of exit or, or at least cash out and get more than what they would get from another private individual. Right. Let's talk about private company to IPO. First, you know, if you think about private company to IPO, the, f the first thing is you, you're opening up to diversified investors now. Right? When Uber goes public, Investors can choose, but it's not Uber's problem. They can't say, well, you can't go to Uber and say, look, I'm an undiversified investor. I'm going to use a total, but you could, but it's not going to help you. Second, there's a control issue that comes about, which is you're now going to be opened up to monitoring and analysts and investors and activist investor could take a role in you. And finally, your disclosure requirements are also going to change. So if you think about valuing an IPO, First, you're going to value it very much like a public company because you're valuing it to diversified investors. Right? So this is my IPO, Twitter pre-IPO valuation. I did a discounted cash flow valuation, and nothing I did was unusual. Almost everything I did reflected what I'd have done. So the same thing, three days ago when I valued Uber, I valued it like a public company. But there's one, one issue in, a private, in an IPO that I have to bring in. Two weeks from now, when Twitter goes, pu when, I'm sorry, when Uber goes public, it's going to issue shares market on the offering day and raise cash. Okay. You're saying, so what? Well, one of the issues with that raise cash is I have to think about what you plan to do with the proceeds. And what are the three things you can do with those proceeds? One is you can pay off debt. And Uber has about six and a half billion dollars in debt that they took probably because they got desperate and there was no VC lined up to pay off debt. In which case, how is it going to show up in your DCF? You're going to change the debt to cap ratio that you use in the valuation. Maybe use an unlevered beta now because they have paid off all the debt. The second thing it can do is what Spotify did. You know what happened in Spotify? The money they raised actually went out at the other door because existing equity investors wanted to cash out. Like Sony wanted to be out. They said, I don't want to be a part of this. So, In which case, your, your job got really easy because you can just ignore what happened the offering day because you're issuing them shares and basically passing the cash. What's the third thing you can do? What, what's Uber planning to do with the cash? Actually, they don't, you can't invest that much money, but they will now raise the cash and use it. Because let's face it, we know they have negative free cash flows coming for the next four years. In a sense, they're preemptively raising the cash today to cover those negative cash flows. And if that's the case, you know what you need to do? You need to add the expected proceeds to your valuation. So if you look at my Twitter valuation, you'll see the IPO proceeds of a billion added to your value. And if you look at my Uber valuation, you'll see a $9 billion proceeds added on. The rumored number right now, right now it's just rumor, that'll be get filled in about two weeks from now when the next prospectus gets filed, is they expect to raise $10 billion on the offering day. You're saying, why didn't I use only $9 billion? They, they didn't specify exactly, but they said a percentage of the proceeds will go for existing owners to cash out. Some of the preferred shareholders want to leave. I don't know how much it is. I've, estimated, I've, I've made the judgment that it's a fairly small percentage. That could change again in the next prospectus, but you see that $9 billion. Now do you see, so that one-time deal will be a kind of push up in your value because you're now going to bring it into value. So that's the first issue with IPOs is you've got to deal with that, the use of the proceeds. The second is, yeah, go ahead. Well, because I'm also going to count the shares in my share count, right? So when they issue these, it's not a freebie. You get $9 billion, but I'm also increasing their share count by almost, a, so when, I, when you look at my intrinsic valuation, what I do is I take the $9 billion and I divide by my intrinsic value per share. 
So they're doing it because they want a cash buffer. They don't want to come back to the market six months from now to raise more equity. So I'm increasing their cash balance, but I'm also increasing their share count. So they can choose not to raise any money. Say so they can say, look, I want only half a billion on the offering. And nothing forces you to go to nine billion. They'll have fewer shares and less cash. So I'm not helping them, I'm not hurting them, I'm just reflecting a reality which is after the IPO, this company will be bigger and have more shares outstanding because of what it chooses to raise on the offering day. Okay. The second is when you're looking at a private company going public, you've got to mop up. Okay. Why? Because each time a venture capitalist invests in a private company, each venture capital investment is almost unique. It's a special contract, special equity deal. They come with options and ratchets and protections and all kinds of stuff. So when companies go public, one of the things you have to look at is what happens to all of those equity investments. In the case of Uber, for instance, if you look at a, it's one of the footnotes, it's actually buried. They talk about 903.6 million convertible preferred shares that the VCs own right now. They'll all be converted to common shares. And then there were a bunch of other add-ons, some of which are almost indis- uh, no, it's almost impossible to figure out what they're, what they're saying, where they talk about these restricted stock units and warrants and options that they've granted. Each of those is draining your value. I tried my best to bring those into the valuation, but some I just threw up my hands. I have no idea what that is. It's, maybe it'll get more explicit in the next prospectus, but they're draining my value. I've got to bring them in. And in terms of how... We said that this is a pricing game. IPOs are a pricing game. Here's something to factor in. Most IPOs come with an investment banking guarantee. That sounds great, right? What is the investment banker guarantee? An offering price. Who sets the offering price? The investment banker. I can guarantee you a price on pretty much anything if you let me set the price. You want to sell your house? I'll guarantee you the price. I don't mention I'm going to set the price at $10, and you have a $100,000 house. Will I have any trouble selling the house? No. Do you see the incentive system here, which is even if Uber's investment bank, which I think of Morgan Stanley and, and no, J.P. Morgan, you know, come up with a pricing that they think is a fair pricing, that's not the price they're going to set it at. They're going to set it at a discount. It's almost built into the system. And... In most IPOs, here's something to remember. Only about $10 billion of equity is going to get monetized on the offering day, right? There are $90 billion, if, if the pricing gets raised, it's $100 billion, of investors in Uber who can't wait to leave. The benchmark capital, who got in his investment billion, can't wait to leave. Why? Because they want to take that money and go to the next most promising. This is their exit. And in most IPOs, they're not allowed to sell for six months or a year. There's a lockout period where they're not allowed. It's part of the IPO prospectus. And file that away because that's going to affect how the pricing happens. So let's say you uh, you take the proceeds. The proceeds can be used to take, you know, taken out of the firm. So basically, you can see how you deal with the proceeds depends on what happens with the proceeds. But let's talk about in Twitter, what was going to happen in the proceeds. The, the proceeds, the company says they're going to raise a billion, and it plans to keep the proceeds in the firm. And every prospect has, has to specify this. So if you don't find it specified, something is wrong. Okay. Let's say, how would the valuation have been different if they'd said they were going to let owners cash out? What, you know, if I go back to the valuation, what would they have done differently? First, there'd be no billion up there, right? And when you do the share count, the share count would probably reflect a much lower number because now they will just take the shares of the people who, that's what Spotify did. They didn't create any new shares. They took shares from the people who wanted to cash out and those were the shares offered on the offering day. So when you've paid for it, it basically went to the owners. So look for information about the proceeds. So if any, you know, I don't know whether you want Pick Pinterest. Right? Pinterest is, you know, Zoom is going to go public. So you can pick their prospectus and value. just read the. Pro- you don't even have to do the valuation. Just read the prospectus to see whether you can see what they're going to do with the growth. Okay. And with the claims from prior equity investors, just clean clean up to the best as you can. As I said, you can have trust preferred. You can have options. You can have warrants. You can have restricted stock. You can do only what you can do with the information you have. So pick up one of those prospectors and see what the other claims are, see what they will do with the claims. 
and don't expect them to be particularly transparent about this process because they want share count to remain fuzzy. You know what, before I was, while I was valuing Uber, I checked the, the Lyft market cap. And I don't know whether I know what the market cap is because when I went to Google, it said the market cap was 17.2 billion. When I went to Yahoo Finance, it said the market cap on the same day was 20.7 billion. You know why? How do they get market cap? What do they do? They take the share price and multiply by shares outstanding. God only knows what Twitter, uh, what, uh, what Yahoo Finance is counting. I think 17.2 billion is closer to the truth because I actually worked it up. I have no idea why Yahoo Finance is three and a half billion dollars more. They must be counting crap in the share count that I don't even know. But that tells you how much disagreement there can be even about share count. And that's why if you look at my Uber valuation, I made a big deal about being explicit about how I ended up with 1,175 million and also being very clear of, hey, I don't know, this number could change because we still have a lot of blank spots in the prospectus that are going to get filled in. So two weeks from now, I have to visit the Uber value per share, even if there's nothing new that comes in the next prospectus. And they probably be a, because the number of shares is going to start to get more solid. So if you look at Twitter, for instance, their owners own the common shares. They have seven classes of convertible preferred. You know what that tells you? There have been seven VC rounds in the company because each one creates its own convertible preferred. There are 86 million restricted stock units. There are 44. I mean, talk about piling on. And when I did my valuation, I had to make sure I counted all the restricted stock, and I had to make sure that I valued the options to get to the value per share because as an equity investor, that's what I'm entitled to. And finally, there's that investment banking guarantee. We know investment banks will underprice IPOs. Why? Because we built a system built around underpricing. So one of the big, you know, this, if you look at studies, studies consistently find that you know, they pay, take 15% off their tip. In fact, it's built into the investment banking rule book on how to price IPOs. Price it, then knock off 15%. So when studies look at IPOs, they do find this 15% this, this underpricing, but it's built in. So if you look at Uber and, and you uh, come up the value per share of 9.97 billion, you can see very quickly that, you know, that the value that you get is going to be much lower than the pricing. Because remember last session, we, we priced Twitter. First, as a banker, which of these two numbers are you going to look at in deciding what to? The value that you've got for Twitter or the pricing of Twitter? Pricing. The pricing. It's a pricing game. And that's my point about what, um, that's my pushback against bankers. Why do you bother with DCFs? in valuation when your job is pricing. Why do we even go through these gymnastics? Okay. You have to price the company. Just tell me what multiple you use, because that's all you've used. And tell me what gymnastics you went through to adjust the multiple. But do you notice in all of these, these companies going public, there is this adjusted EBITDA number that they spend a great deal on? You know why they do it, right? Because they know investors and analysts are lazy. So what do they do? They pay a multiple of EBITDA. So the more they can pump into that adjusted EBITDA, the higher the price. You know, we get the companies we deserve. You pay 20 times EBITDA for something, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to find a way to pump everything up. So when you look at that adjusted EBITDA, the, the motive for it comes from the fact that we do pricing, and so much of our pricing is lazy and sloppy, a multiple of EBITDA. So there's the evidence in IPO pricing. If you look at what happens on the offering day, on average, IPOs are underpriced by about 15%. The smaller IPOs are underpriced by more than the larger IPOs. But across the board, IPOs have been underpriced for as long as we've seen them. And for much of finance's early academic, you know, when you looked at academic papers, they called it the puzzle. But here's what the puzzle was. Why would the owners of these companies allow bankers to underprice the off? Because you're leaving money on the table, right? That should be your money. So why do you think they allow? Because they probably don't charge as much for success Well, remember, they, the 6% the is a, the underwriting guarantee is kind of pointless. You pay them 6% for a guarantee that they can sell your asset for 15% less than it's worth. That's not even a guarantee. 
It sounds like a great deal for bankers. It sounds like a terrible deal for the rest of us. Yeah. In fact, you know the flaw in that original puzzle argument was the assumption that these academics were making is 100% of the shares are offered to the public because then you leave 15% of the table, that's a lot of money. But what do we say Uber is going to do? It's going to make a $10 billion proceed. Let's say it underpriced. it's underpriced. They leave $2 billion on the table. It acts like almost uh, an advertising, right? Because what are you going to read in the next day in the newspaper? Uber stock price jumps an offering. And you read it, and what do you say? I wish I'd been there. So what do you do next? You go out and you buy it. And you know those people who are coming six months from now, they want you to be pushing up the price because the bulk of the cashing out happens not on the offering day, but six months or a year or a year and a half later. It's, there's lots of stuff that can go wrong, but you can see why people underprice it. But couldn't you make money on these underpriced IPOs though? Because if it is true IPOs are underpriced, if I bought every IPO that's coming to the market, shouldn't I be able to make money? Just bid, uh, try to get in on the So what I do is I, remember you, you send your application in for I want 1,000 shares of Pinterest, 1,000 shares of, you know, shouldn't I, that be a lucrative strategy? You ask for 1,000 shares, will you always get 1,000 shares? No, in, the, the, in those offerings that are oversubscribed, you're going to get 250 shares. But in some of your applications, you're going to get all 1,000 shares and you wish you hadn't. You know why, right? Because these are the ones which were undersubscribed. You're going to get all the shares and an offering price will be 30% lower. You're going to get this problem in your portfolio where you're overweighted in you know, overpriced IPOs and there have been mutual funds that have tried to create around the strategy. They have never been able to make money for that very simple reason. If you can find a way to select those IPOs that are, un that are going to go up, of course. And that's where maybe combining intrinsic valuation with pricing might give you a way of finding those companies. But you can see already why when people make a big deal of this, they're missing the point, both as bankers and as investors. Last question and we'll end for the day. Yep. You might. You might not be able to sell the shares, which means you're hoping that the jump in the price stays for six months or a year. Okay. So let's, uh, we'll pick up, uh, we're almost done with private company valuation. Your quiz will cover pretty much everything through that private company valuation. You can ignore the IPO part, there's really not much there. Let me take that back. Leave the IPO part in because that's part of everything else. But everything we've done through this will be fair game for your quiz. I haven't written your quiz, actually. So one of these days I will, before Monday, hopefully. So.